Okay, um, just a little bit of background about myself before we start. I uh, graduated from Carnegie Mellon University um, in 2002, um, and actually Christine uh, was one of my advisors. She was in my committee. I learned so much uh, from her um, over the years. Um, since then, I've been at the University of Texas, Austin, um, McComb School of Business. Um, Research-wise, um, I work in corporate finance and also uh, behavioral asset pricing. I've written papers on um, corporate investment policy, capital structure, IPOs, and so on. And more recently, I've been uh, focused on uh, behavioral asset pricing models. Uh, Methodology-wise, uh, I work mostly with quantitative models, although I've also done a little bit more work with theory and empirics as well. Uh, and I teach uh, various corporate finance type courses in our graduate programs. Now, a lot of what I'll tell you today is um, based on my experiences um, as an assistant professor, uh, various mistakes made, uh, I would say back then. And also uh, being on the other side of things, um, I've been uh, quite involved with our rookie uh, recruiting over the years, uh, mentoring our assistant professors and so on. Um, you know, I'll try to say uh, a few things that I learned um, from, 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 those, uh, from those observations. Finally, I've headed our PhD program uh, for the past seven years. So I had the privilege of working with a large number of PhD students um, many of whom are assistant professors in various institutions right now. So watching their intellectual growth um, over the years here and, and, and after when they get their jobs, uh, I'll tell you a few things uh, based on those observations as well. Okay, so I'm gonna structure my talk in three parts. First, I'll talk a little bit about the transition from being a PhD student uh, to an assistant professor. Uh, then we'll talk about the job of being an assistant professor, what you do, uh, what you should be careful about in doing your job. And in the third part, I'll briefly talk about um, some of the things you can do as an assistant professor um, with a longer term perspective in terms of building a successful uh, career. And then I'll conclude. Okay, so um, many of you are in your uh, last year as PhD students, you're on the job market. Hopefully things will go well. Uh, you're gonna get a job that you like. Um, you'll finish your dissertation, you'll defend, um, and then you'll transition uh, from being a PhD student to an assistant professor um, over the next year, from next spring to, say, next fall. How is that transition? How does that feel? Uh, many people in our profession would argue that uh, being a, an assistant professor is not much different from being a PhD student, except that you get paid better. Uh, you hear that a lot. Uh, I see the argument, um, you know, obviously you have ongoing research projects, you'll continue working on them. So in that regard, nothing changes, but I think that kind of oversimplifies that transition a bit. I think there is a uh, non-trivial um, aspect uh, to your new job as an, as an assistant professor. Um, when you're a PhD student, um, you're, you're working very, very hard, but um, you're working on uh, relatively well-defined and well-structured milestones, okay? So uh, you need to finish a summer paper. Uh, you need to um, start your, on your dissertation, um, you know, um, form your committee, uh, be on the job market, propose, defend, and so on. Um, when you become an assistant professor, you'll find out very quickly that things are a little bit more open-ended, a bit more uh, vague in some sense and, and nebulous. Um, I remember my very first day, in my office, this was at least six months after the job market, several months after uh, graduation. And it, it hit me that I was dealing with something very different now. You know, there weren't any advisors uh, to, to respond to anymore. It was more like, um, you know, I'm in charge of, of a career. Uh, how do I start this? So there's that mental transition that can be quite difficult, especially on those of you um, who have been students all your life. That was my situation. I did not have any prof professional experience prior. Um, so, you know, that, that transition from being a student to being a professional will take some time uh, mentally. You may feel isolated um, in your first uh, few weeks or, or even months. You're in your office. Yes, you're working. You have work to do, but you don't really know a lot of people around. That can be uh, stressful. A couple of suggestions I can make in this regard. Uh, first, 
join your new department as early as you can. Uh, if you can join early in the summer, that's great. Um, you know, you'll have to go through that adjustment period anyways. Uh, you might as well get it out of the way uh, as soon as you can. The other thing you can do is uh, start teaching early. Um, many of you as assistant professors um, will be teaching, will have concentrated teaching in one semester. If you teach in the fall, it's sort of like a commitment mechanism to get involved early on. Because when you're teaching, you're going to have to deal with a whole lot of things uh, administrative, material-wise, and so on. So you'll have to talk to a lot of folks um, to get answers to those questions. And that's a very good way to get um, get the ball rolling to speed up your integration into, into your new department. There's going to be changes um, in your daily life and daily routine. Um, again, there aren't going to be any advisors or supervisors to periodically report to anymore. That means you're going to have greater flexibility um, you can do your work whenever you like, from wherever you like. Uh, over the years, I've seen some individuals who thrive uh, in that flexible environment. So some of my colleagues travel extensively, both for personal and professional reasons, yet get a lot of work done. But for others, this can be stressful. You know, the, the flexibility uh, may take some time to, to adjust to. Many of us prefer uh, kind of an order and perhaps an order that's imposed on us. So it'll take some time for you to get used to that kind of flexibility, especially in, in your earlier days. Um, in your first year as an assistant professor, uh, I think you should be doing a few things well. First, um, learn about your new environment and learn as much as you can. Uh, universities are fairly complex organizations. Their organizational structures are kind of more complicated compared to many other types of institutions. And in such um, complex organizations, as you can imagine, there are meaningful differences between um, formal authority and real authority. Some, in some departments, the department chair is very important and influential. In other departments, it's more of a figurehead. Maybe the real uh, authority, real decisions lie elsewhere. Okay, so you're gonna have to find your way, navigate your way around this. And one of the best ways to do this is to have some mentors. Uh, some people you feel close to, you feel comfortable asking questions. I'm not talking about something, someone very senior, like um, mentoring you in a research capacity. It's more like somebody who's four or five years ahead of you, who's been there, who knows the place, who knows how things work around and can help you uh, navigate your, your new department. Um, there's going to be a steep learning curve uh, in your first year, but this is crucial um, not just administrative things, but more importantly, these sort of more subtle issues about how uh, your new institution really works. And um, in addition to this, don't be shy to ask questions uh, to your department chair on administrative matters. Um, you know, what is your teaching load going to be next year? Um, what is your research budget? Can you spend more money? Can you, can the department buy a data set for you? Um, you know, you should be asking these types of questions. Uh, as much as you can. Um, the second piece of advice I can give you for your first year is uh, to submit your job market paper. Okay, so we tend to delay this. The paper is never good enough. Uh, you want to spend a few more months on it to make it better. Uh, for the most part, that uh, extra time you're spending on the paper is wasted time. So there could be good reasons to wait. Sometimes, say, you're waiting for a new data set or something uh, that'll uh, improve the paper substantially, but by and large, it's not worth it. Uh, you should uh, try to submit your job market paper and other papers uh, in your first year so that your desk is clear and you can start new uh, projects. Um, finally, you should recognize um, that your visibility will dip after the job market. In the job market, you're getting a lot of attention. Um, you know, you're talking to many schools, uh, many folks in these schools, they're being very polite and nice to you. They're taking you out to dinners. So you think that everything is going great, you know, you're kind of uh, introducing yourself to these folks, but then right after the job market, you'll, you'll see that many of them don't, will not remember you. You know, the job market is this busy affair where a lot of people meet a lot of people, but, you know, comes next year, uh, they're not going to remember you. So unfortunately, you'll need to reintroduce yourself uh, to the profession and to some extent to your colleagues in your new institution as well, especially if it's a large department. Don't expect them to necessarily remember who you are and what you do. Um, in terms of external visibility, 
um, don't skip conferences, especially major conferences. As an assistant professor, you should be going to major conferences every year. Um, then external speakers visit your department, um, meet with them, uh, entertain them, go to dinners with them, and so on and so forth. In terms of your internal visibility, uh, one of the most crucial things is obviously to go to all the seminars uh, that, that you should, but also be active. Okay, so that's the easiest way for you to introduce yourself uh, to your department more broadly, uh, let them know who you are and, and, and what you do. Okay, um, so what do you do as an assistant professor? Um, you do research, you wanna publish these papers that you write and you wanna get tenure. So in some sense, the objective is simple. The question is, you know, how do you do that? What are some of do's and don'ts in this regard? The first thing I would tell you is that you should recognize that you do not control all parts of this process. Um, if you are inclined to complain, there is a lot to complain in our profession, okay? You're gonna, you're gonna be mad at uh, the editors and the referees who are rejecting your paper while accepting papers that you think are inferior to yours. Um, you're gonna be complaining about the state of the profession. You'll have a hard time understanding why the new, new thing is getting so much attention you think that perhaps um, it's not worth it. You're gonna have issues with your direct competition. Um, you know, assistant professors in your, in your department, maybe they're getting more attention than you think they should. Um, some of this is healthy. Uh, we're in a business where we need to be critical. We need to be thinking about these things, but don't overdo it. At the end of the day, what you control as an assistant professor is your own research, the papers you write, just focus on them, uh, you're gonna get more out of uh, your, your career that way. Don't, don't get uh, distracted by the other stuff going, going around you. In terms of research expectations, uh, portfolio and, and, and planning, um, very soon as you start as an assistant professor, you'll find out that there's this weird communication game between uh, the senior faculty and you regarding tenure standards. Okay, you'll find out that um, the, 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 the senior faculty will be reluctant to um, tell you exactly what the standards are, how many papers you need to publish, uh, where they need to be published. They're not doing this to be nasty to you. There are very good reasons for institutions to not commit to exact standards. For example, um, a lot of departments go through life cycles. They may start as a small department, maybe they're going through a growth phase, Maybe they're maturing now, reaching steady state. In all these phases, the tenure standards will be different. So in all likelihood, in your next job, the way tenure decisions were made five years ago are very different than how they will be made five years from now. Okay, so you have to learn how to live with this um, kind of vagueness um, and the fact that your, the senior, your senior colleagues are not communicating very clearly and directly with you. Uh, all I can say is, um, learn how to read in between the lines. Okay, so while they're not necessarily telling you exactly what the standards are, they're in the process of making decisions about other people um, or making comments, making statements about other people. If you try to read in between the lines, you'll get a picture, of course, an imperfect picture of what those standards might be. Um, a crucial decision that you'll have to make um, in building your research portfolio is um, specialization versus diversification. How focused do you need to be? There are various factors here at play. Um, first and foremost, it's your preferences. Uh, some people <clears throat> like to um, go from one topic to another to learn new things um, every time they write a new paper. Others like to go deeper. They want to be an expert in an area. They want to know everything knowable in one particular area. So your preferences will obviously matter. I think there is a bit of a case to be made for um, diversification as a risk management policy vis-a-vis -vis your senior colleagues' tastes. If you are too narrowly specialized in one area, you're running the risk uh, that when you're up for tenure, um, some of your senior colleagues might say, eh, you know, this person published X many papers, but I just don't like the research question. I don't think this is important enough. And you may think that that's unfair, but that does happen. So from a risk management perspective, uh, branching out to one or two other things, uh, not too much perhaps, but just having a couple other types of papers in different areas with different methodologies could help 
uh, quite a bit in terms of convincing uh, those colleagues. Um, too much diversification obviously is, is costly. Um, you're gonna have to pay switching costs, the fixed costs of learning uh, new areas. And also if your research is all over the place, you're not gonna make it, you're not gonna be able to make a name. Uh, people will not know uh, what your expertise is. So all in all, my advice in this regard would be, I think you should have one or two main areas that, which, that, that you're known for, but it's also a good idea to have a couple other papers in, in somewhat different um, topics, methodologies, and so on, um, that'll show to, to others, especially to people who will evaluate you uh, later on, that you're able to work with different kinds of material. Okay, um, you need to do a good job as an assistant professor of, of managing um, the flow of projects. Ideally, at each point in time, you want to have papers under review, working papers that you're presenting in conferences and invited uh, presentations, earlier stage papers that perhaps you're presenting to your colleagues internally, but you're not ready yet to advertise more broadly, and even earlier stage ideas, you know, ideas that you hope to turn into papers uh, in the future. So ideally you want all these four buckets to be full to some extent, none of them to be, uh, to be empty. The other thing that you'll need to manage well is the school year. Um, teaching, especially early on, is gonna eat a lot of your time. Uh, the prep time is big, plus obviously you'll be spending um, time on an ongoing basis by, uh, for your teaching. Um, some folks are able to manage um, to get a lot of research done while they're teaching. Others can't. Others get kind of paralyzed in their teaching semester. So you may be one type or the other. Know your type and plan around it. Okay, so if you're teaching next semester and you know that it's going to be very busy, you need to know what exactly, what research activities you want to finish. You need to uh, finish before teaching starts what kind of activities are doable while you're teaching and what kind of activities, research activities will start or restart right after um, your teaching ends. Okay, so this is an ongoing cycle and you don't wanna be on the wrong side of the cycle, um, having, um, having a plan um, for the next couple of semesters and summer will help uh, tremendously. Co-authors, um, you're gonna need them to be productive. It's very difficult in our profession to survive if you're writing papers uh, by yourself. Uh, however, uh, I would say you should be picking your co-authors um, carefully. Ideally, um, your co-authors should have the same incentives as you do. As an early stage assistant professor, for instance, um, you wanna work with other early stage assistant professors because they are after the same objectives exactly the same objectives as you are. Now in practice, this is not necessarily gonna happen. You'll be working with all sorts of people, um, your advisors from your grad school, um, some senior colleagues in your new institution, PhD students, so on and so forth. And uh, I think this is fine, obviously to be productive, you wanna work with um, uh, many people, but um, you should be cognizant of um, some of the frictions that can, that can arise. For example, when you're working with a senior colleague, on the one hand, uh, you may think that this is great because you're gonna benefit from their research wisdom, but on the other hand, they're working on a different kind of clock uh, than you are. Uh, they're not in a rush to get tenure, okay? So that's, that's kind of an example of a friction that you may run into. Your colleagues, uh, in particular, your, your senior colleagues, you should know that from day one, you're constantly be being evaluated and compared to others, okay? This can be annoying, but it's a fact. Um, and these observations on you, these evaluations culminate in some soft information about you, which will be in all likelihood uh, quite important when you're up for tenure. What kind of soft information? It's information about your IQ, about your creativity, about your work ethic, about your collegiality, even about your personality. Many of us may find it kind of unfair that stuff that's not on your CV, this kind of soft information, impressions and observations will make a difference when you're up for tenure, but whether we like it or not, they do. I've seen cases where uh, the soft information works in favor of the candidate. 
especially in close cases where it tilts things in favor of uh, tenure, I've seen other cases where actually it goes the opposite direction. So this is something to be careful about. Um, you can learn a lot from your senior colleagues. Uh, so I, earlier I talked about having a mentor who's gonna show you around. This is a bit different. We're talking about more senior people here who have a lot of research experience and wisdom. You're gonna be learning a lot from them uh, in terms of developing your own research tastes. That said, uh, you need to understand that senior faculty, uh, whether they're wise or not, tend to have very strong opinions. So in some sense, you need to learn how to learn from senior faculty. That's a process. That's not going to happen overnight. Uh, but when you finally reach that state, you're going to be getting a lot from your senior faculty members, uh, from colleagues. You're going to learn a lot of subtle things that you cannot find in textbooks and, 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 and papers. Okay. Um, let me speed up a bit, maybe. I think I have about 10 minutes or so. Is that correct? I think so. Okay. Um, most departments will do a great job of shielding you from office politics. My suggestion would be don't get into it. You should, you should keep your eyes and ears open, obviously, about what's going on around you. But if there are fights concerning promotion decisions, uh, hiring decisions, and so on, you know, for the most part, these fights don't concern you as an assistant professor. And you know, don't get involved. There's not much upside in that. Teaching versus research. Um, later in the panel, uh, we'll talk more about uh, teaching. I don't want to say a whole lot in this regard here. But uh, one point that I would make is that the temptation as an assistant professor is to teach something very simple, um, so that you know, like a finance 101 type course, so that you have more time for research. Um, that's understandable. But you should also know that teaching more advanced material is a great opportunity. Um, it's a great investment into your future research. Obviously, teaching PhD courses is important, but even more applied courses like an MBA program or undergraduate program, uh, advanced material in corporate finance or asset pricing can give you a lot of ideas. Okay, so I would, at least I, I personally uh, would prefer teaching more advanced material paying the, the prep time up front, um, but uh, get more out of my teaching in, in connection with, with research. Service-wise, you're not going to be asked to do much, uh, especially early on as an assistant professor. Again, you'll be shielded from, from service, but there are certain activities that you should be engaged in. Uh, one is PhD advising. It's not even service. It's closer to research, obviously, but um, be uh, on PhD committees uh, as early as uh, and as often as, as you can, that's, that's great involvement uh, in your department. The other thing that, that's going to be very useful is to get involved in junior recruiting. Um, you're going to learn so much both about how our profession works and also about uh, how your department works. And, you know, earlier I talked about, you know, your senior colleagues' views about things. When you go to the job market, you're going to learn quite a bit about how they think about you and others and more broadly about our profession, especially in your first year, it's gonna be an eye-opening experience. So do get involved as much as you can in junior recruiting in the years your school is hiring. Okay, third part, um, building um, a successful long-term career. As an assistant professor, you're focused on tenure as you should be, uh, but once you get it, um, you'll feel, I think most people feel, that it is not the great reward that you thought it would be. Uh, in other words, it feels less like mission accomplished. It feels more like an extension of a lease. You have more time to do research now. And you know it's obviously better to get tenure than not, but it doesn't seem like that, that great thing that you thought it was initially. The main reason for this is that ultimately, uh, you want a successful research career beyond publishing X many papers in, in uh, certain journals. You want to be well known uh, for something and you're going to be respected for something. Now, much of this obviously is going to happen after your tenure, if it ever does happen. So this is obviously a higher hurdle, but there's certain things you can do perhaps well as an assistant professor to help, help your case in the long run. Um, first, choosing your areas of expertise well. Um, earlier, we talked about portfolio, research portfolio, perhaps being too narrow. Um, there are 
certain areas, certain topics where you may be able to publish papers in good journals, but not necessarily make a lot of impact. Even the best journals in economics and finance um, publish a lot of marginal work. You know, these are papers that should be in print, but they're, they're not going to make a name for you. So you want to, in some sense, think about um, topics of broader interest, you know, what people will be reading and writing on um, five years, 10 years from now. We also talked about co-authors uh, earlier. If you can find a long-term collaborator who um, you're on the kind of same intellectual uh, frequency, frequency uh, you get along well intellectually and personally and have a long-term co-author relationship, that can make all the difference. Some of the most groundbreaking work in economics and finance has been done by uh, these co-author teams, uh, people who are able to work well together uh, over, over the years. Finally, um, as an assistant professor, you'll have um, a relatively short window in which you can change your job if you need to. It's not going to happen in your first year as an assistant professor. In all likelihood, it's not going to happen in the year uh, you're up for tenure or, or, or after you get tenure. But in the middle part, um, there may be opportunities. And you need to think very carefully about them. Um, if you can be more productive and more impactful elsewhere, perhaps um, it's a good idea to move. Obviously, this decision involves many other aspects like your personal life, uh, your other commitments, and so on. But there's going to be that relatively short window, maybe a couple of years, in which such opportunities may arise. So keep, keep an eye on them. Okay, just to conclude uh, with a couple of final thoughts, um, I think this is a very competitive and tough um, profession, but it's also extremely rewarding. Uh, think about the millions and millions of people out there who are working uh, in jobs that they don't intrinsically enjoy. They're kind of stuck with their jobs. In academia, the vast majority of us actually like what we do. Um, you know, there's a lot of value, both of producing ideas, but also consuming uh, ideas produced by others. So appreciate and enjoy this privilege of being an academic. And to maximize your enjoyment, try to find ways of filtering out the noise. As you already know, academia attracts a lot of people with strong egos and due to selection effects in the next stage when you become an assistant professor you're going to you're going to meet with pe meet people with even bigger egos okay and that can be annoying at times um, but as i always tell to our phd students find a way of kind of separating ideas from people we are in this because we love ideas um, just you know try to find a way of ignoring uh, some of the annoying behavior that you, you will have to deal with for sure um, in, your, in your career. You're going to be learning so much in your first 10 years in academia. Much of that will overlap with your assistant professor years, but I think the process continues a bit a few years afterwards. What you are able to learn, what you do learn, as well as what you don't learn in your first 10 years will shape you up as a researcher intellectually, as a professional, how you, you know, deal with your profession, your colleagues, and even personally, I would say, one of the peculiar things about our profession is that being social scientists, our subject matter is, is human behavior. So over the years, you're going to see increasing parallels between what you do as a job and how you um, interact with people around you, your loved ones, your friends, your social scientist perspective will have an increasing effect on, 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 on in these regards. Uh, and I think that's part of the enjoyment of the job as well. Um, so. This is all I have. Hopefully I was on time. Um, I am very much looking forward to hearing uh, what the other panelists have, have to say and also our Q&A and later um, in the afternoon, the research sessions.